This video is brought to you by Skillshare. Hey, brother! It goes without saying that Harry Potter is an example of exemplary writing with an immersive world that hundreds of millions of people have fallen in love with. A world with fantastic beasts, imaginative objects, places, and characters. A world that allows us to escape reality to a magical place with a relatable hero that we can all see a little of ourselves in. Now, let's talk about everything that's wrong with it. If you are new to the channel, welcome and be sure to subscribe. We talk about Harry Potter and other stuff too. Jay, today I'm going to be counting down the top 10 things that are just awfully convenient in Harry Potter. Starting with number 10, Harry's lack of living relatives. Okay, so maybe this particular one is extremely inconvenient for Harry himself, but it's rather convenient to the plot. Poor, poor little Harry, growing up not alone, but may as well be, under the care of some of the worst sort of muggles imaginable. A humble kid, so near to so much love, and yet receiving so little of it. A kid who, unbeknownst to himself, came from a well-to-do and well respected wizarding family and yet here he is living under some stairs with a shocking number of spiders for an otherwise immaculate house. James and Lily died at age 21. How are there no aunts, uncles, grandparents, siblings, any other living relatives around? Of course there was a godfather who would have loved him like a son, although he was unfortunately wrongfully imprisoned. In fairness, he was trying to murder someone. Alas, no, Harry must endure a childhood of neglect and underestimation because that's what makes Harry, Harry, no matter how convenient it is. Number nine, Hermione's weird relationship with her parents. First off, Hermione being there at all for Harry is just convenient in and of itself. She basically is the hero. But Hermione, like Harry, grows up in the muggle world, although unlike Harry, to loving and caring parents who are ironically dentists, since she has Teeth. Despite these loving parents, though, it seems like Hermione spends every single available vacation either staying at Hogwarts or at the Weasleys. I mean, like, how bummed would you be if Hermione was your daughter and she was so loving and smart and sweet and all she ever wanted to do was spend time elsewhere and maybe max two weeks a year with you? Though it does work out for Harry and Ron, though, otherwise the whole series may have ended Devil's Snare. Lucky Hermione pays attention in herbology. Number eight, the Knight Bus. Jay, the Knight Bus itself is not anything that I specifically hold that much gripe with. I mean, it seems wizardy enough. Except, of course, for being like one of very few muggle technologies adopted by wizards, but either way. But my issue with it has less to do with its existence and potentially terrible business model considering all the different other ways wizards can travel. You keeping that thing running on hot chocolate sales, Shunpike? But no, my issue has so much more to do with just how Harry summons it. I would have so much preferred for Harry to just know how it works than just like famously accidentally falling over and it coming to his aid. Like if Harry doesn't fall over, what happens next in that scene? Does he just like live at the playground forever? Because for some reason that's always what I've imagined what would have happened. Actually, no, instead Sirius just transforms back into a human, explains everything to Harry 20 chapters sooner, they go and kill Pettigrew, and Voldemort never returns. Seriously, Harry, you fell over for! I didn't do it on purpose. No, but it actually just bothers me because Harry's ignorance to the magical world is just constantly used as a plot device. Hermione can constantly inform him of things because she's clever and reads all of the books. And Ron simply has a lifetime of experience in the wizarding world. That's wizard's chess. But Harry, on the other hand, seems to constantly either being helped or accidenting himself into figuring out things in the magical world that he just feels so welcome in. You know who that reminds me of? Tom Riddle. Tom, on the other hand, though, spent all of his time unlocking as many secrets about the magical world as he possibly could, including the Chamber of Secrets, finding many long lost relics, and some of the most advanced magic known to wizard kind. Harry does do a lot of the same things, but not on purpose. Fred George gave him the Marauder's Map, Dobby knew about the Room of Requirement, half the time it was just because he was running from Filch, or finally because Hagrid is the worst secret keeper ever. I shouldn't have told you that. Number seven, Time Turners. Number six, the Marauder's Map. J.K. Rowling even agrees with them. On Pottermore, she has said, the Marauder's Map subsequently became something of a bane to its true originator, me, because it allowed Harry a little too much freedom of information. Do you think? I mean, with this thing, you would imagine that Harry would never ever be caught doing anything ever. And yet, Harry is awful at using it, and holding on to it. Lupin takes it, Snape uses it, Barty Crouch Jr. uses it to incredible effect to remain hidden. Meanwhile, Harry never looks for Sirius or notice Peter Pettigrew or Barty Crouch except for that one time. And then of course there's that whole issue behind Fred and George just happening to never notice that Ron's sleeping next to another guy every night. Number five, 
Polyjuice Potion. Okay, so Polyjuice Potion is one of those things when you first encounter it, it's kind of awesome. It really seems like we're watching these kids go completely against the odds, spending an enormous amount of time at fairly significant risk to brew this very difficult potion. Not to mention at the time, it seems so far beyond their skill level that it would have been ridiculous for any other second year to even worry remotely that somebody might be using it against them. The second time it's used, I would say it's a spectacular plot twist. Moody was Barty Crouch Jr the whole time, but every single time it's used after that, too much, too much. It seems like they just always happen to have some available. Like it no longer feels like this really elusive potion that was incredibly difficult to brew. It just kind of seems like if you have enough time, sure we could have some. Man, Harry, I do not know how we're gonna solve this one. I do, we'll use Polyjuice Potion. Why didn't I think of that? I have no clue, it is literally always our plan. Buying on Malfoy, check. Battle of Seven Potters, check. Bill and Fleur's wedding, check. Breaking into the ministry, check. Breaking into Gringotts, check. Except Ron, we'll just transfigure him for this one, for some reason. Number four, Felix Felicis. Liquid luck. I'm not actually sure if this potion is convenient or otherwise just flat out useless. Harry wins this potion on the first day of class that Slughorn just randomly was brewing for like the past eight months while on the run. Harry uses it to complete a task that despite Dumbledore always telling him it's extremely important, he literally never takes seriously. A task that Dumbledore knows Harry can complete entirely on his own. Otherwise, it's just mere presence successfully placebos Ron into being good at Quidditch and maybe prevents Ginny, Hermione, and Ron from getting hit with curses the night of Dumbledore's death, but it could have just also been the case that they're capable wizards. All three of them do survive the Battle of Hogwarts after all. And that's really the problem. It undercuts the actual skill of the characters. Harry could always get the memory from Slughorn. They were always going to do well in those battles. Ron was always going to be in his own head and actually be good at things if he could just get out of it. Number three, Harry's name in the Goblet of Fire. Okay, so this probably wasn't entirely convenient for Voldemort and company who had to put in a ton of planning and organization to figure out how to make it happen. But it's convenient that nobody, Dumbledore, investigates it after the fact. Do you remember how mad everyone was that underage wizards couldn't compete in the Triwizard Tournament? That's rubbish! And how Fred and George, two wizards who we know go on to be incredibly capable, like fail horrifically in putting their names in. And how it's called the Tri-Wizard Tournament and four people end up entered. And how that means that Hogwarts has two contestants. And how Harry is underage. Age, and how Dumbledore drew the age line himself, and how it was pointed out by the culprit himself how it was obviously done by dark magic. I mean, everyone is all up in arms about it, but nobody seems to spend any time figuring out who or why someone got his name in there. Everybody's all like, this is an outrage! Guess we'll see what happens. This isn't just like some random student. It's Harry freaking Potter. We know that he's marked by the darkest of all wizards of all time. Now let's see. Who could it have been? Get, get there faster, Dumbledore! Number two, Basilisk Venom and the Sword of Gryffindor. I mean, seriously, it takes Harry approximately one page to destroy the first Horcrux and then 3,404 to destroy the next. Worth noting that Dumbledore does get the ring in there somewhere. Good thing he doesn't tell Harry how he destroyed it, though, even though Harry asks like a zillion times. That would have just been too... Convenient. Do you see what I did there? This is a list about things that are awfully convenient. That could have been on the list. Like, oh, it was just too easy. Dumbledore just told him how to do it. But it just goes to show how the list doesn't mean things that are always convenient for Harry. Like, for real, one of the very few things that can actually destroy a Horcrux just so happens to be there when Harry, like, jams it into the diary. Under any other circumstance, that scene doesn't go well for Harry. <laughs> Oh crap, did, did, did you just, did you just stab my book? What, what, what is that gonna do? And don't even get me started on how not only does Harry have the perfect tool for destroying a Horcrux, but the only thing known to cure Basilisk Venom just happens to come flying right on into the scene. This is all just basically proof that Felix Felicis does nothing. Look how lucky Harry is already. And number one, how Harry becomes master of the Elder Wand. Okay, now stick with me. Harry takes Malfoy's wand from him. Master of the Elder Wand. It's mine. I mean, this was ridiculous when it just meant that Harry became the master of Malfoy's wand, let alone all other wands that Malfoy has ever been the master of. <laughs> it like seems like a weird trick that an older sibling would play on you. I'm taking this from you. 
which makes this mine too. Except in this example, it would also include a toy that mom and dad got for me, but never told me about, and I never knew I even had. Not to mention, Harry doesn't do this with any knowledge that he is becoming the master of the Elder Wand in the process. He just kind of lucks into that situation after unlucking himself into Malfoy Manor. Either way, I would have been totally fine with this if we could have just seen like an epic duel between Harry and Malfoy, the rivalry that we've been watching grow for the past seven years. Malfoy takes like some low blow and Harry being Harry would just like disarm him like boom, good, victorious over bad. But nah, he just takes it from him. Guys, for my question of the day, is there anything that super bothered you about the Harry Potter books? Is there anything you agreed with us or disagreed with us about? Be sure to leave your thoughts in the towel section down below. Now, Harry has a lot of convenient things happen to him in the wizarding world, but you know what's super convenient here in the real world? Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, photo, and more. One of the most common questions that we get is, how do you get into making YouTube channels? How do you start video editing? What kind of equipment do you need? Well, Skillshare is a wonderful place to go to get answers to all of these questions. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there. An annual membership is less than $10 a month. But today we have a special offer for you where the first 1,000 people to click the link in the description down below can get their first two months for just 99 cents. We here at Super Carlin Brothers edit all of our videos on Adobe Premiere Pro. Skillshare.com is going to have tons of classes to teach you how to edit. Personally, I wish I had this when I started Super Carlin Brothers because I had to learn how to edit on my own and I was super bad at it. And again, the first 1,000 people to use the link down below get their first two months for just 99 cents. Super Carlin Psych Club. Guys, as always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. If you would like to learn more about Felix Felicis and how it just does nothing, you can click this video right here. Here, or if you would like to join in on our monthly live stream via our Patreon, you can check out our Patreon page right here. The live stream will be next week at the $15 patronage level. You can actually tune in, ask us questions on the call, and we can answer all of them for you. But Jay, that's all I've got for you today, man. I will see you on Tuesday.